Welcome back to a very British space program. This is episode nine. We are in 1955. And um, yeah, it's time for us to go to orbit or at least try. So um, while we put together what will be our largest rocket, why don't you join us on the road there? So you find us in the VAB and we are just putting together the Red Princess 3A. It's actually the 3B that we will attempt to launch. This is just the first build, the 3B. Um, the, the 3A was actually built a, a quite a while ago. This this video was a while back. Um, and since then we'd got some uprated uh, gamma engines. So we had the 301 engines instead of the 201 engines. So um, we modified our original plan for the Red Princess 3A and turned it the Red Princess 3B. Never flew the 3A. So. This is the craft we're gonna try and get to orbit with. And it is big compared to anything else we've ever built. It is big. It is, uh, it's taking our next level launch pad that we've got. It's got a lot of engines. Um, we've got guidance on most of the stages. Um, yeah, it's heavy. It, it's not that efficient because we are not far through the tech tree at the moment. This is pretty much pre-orbital tech. So we're gonna try and do it. This is not the same sort of quality of engine as you got on say the black arrow which had actually gamma engines but there were much better engines than these ones so while that builds we need to do some other stuff and the other stuff begins with a flight of the red arrow 2b x farley 2 so what we've actually done on this we've got rodney in the cockpit and we've actually operated the engines on this as well um, you can see we've had another a flame out on this and this actually triggered a change in my plans quite considerably so we had a, a flame out on on one of the engines in the tail there again you can see this has got five engines we lost one of the side ones we had to counter it by, by closing another one off rodney is uh, terrified obviously he gets up to about uh, 60 kilometers which completes the uh, the actual mission um however uh, it started having me have worries about these engines because if we lose a couple on the red princess that's an awful lot of build time gone in the toilet so that actually delayed our orbital attempt just a little bit while we did some other work shall we say so rodney comes through the atmosphere you can see we, we've been up at 60 kilometers and he, he comes in really nicely actually there's this there's that, that heating problem on the uh, on the nose again but i think we're pretty much limited to that by the cockpit he uh comes in pretty fast we this this craft does land at exceedingly high speeds he tries to uh, we decide to pull out and just try the, the parachutes because i'm concerned about the nose at that point so next launch is uh, another one of our rockets this is going to be the red eye and this one is going to go up to 150 kilometers and hopefully travel 400 kilometers downrange this is again still the early sort of start of 1955 um we're just basically increasing the the difficulty of our contracts at the moment and so the red eyes just spin around there hits its target altitude decouples and we're going to try and recapture that or we're going to get that uh, payload back to earth and get some science out of it and we've seen this before i'm just going to run through this nice and quickly so the the red eye comes back through the atmosphere um that nice heavy uh heavy avionics unit at the bottom there acts as its uh as, a, as an air brake almost as a as a heat shield and um, we come through and parachutes open won't waste your time with this though you know what's going to happen parachutes open boop -ba boom down we go nice and quick nice and easy so on to another one right quick turnaround time and we've got uh, matthew west now and he is flying the same craft that rodney was in we've uh, refixed the engines obviously and he's now aiming for 65 kilometers so we're now pushing right towards the edge of our our survival limits that we've got in this craft and he's taking a very vertical approach to this before he levels out you'll see one of the, the plans for this craft was that um we actually shut down all the engines apart from the core one and the core middle one will actually continue the burn and give us some control down. Um, interestingly, uh, he actually got over 75. The, the target I think was 65, but he's he's gone well over it and that, that is pretty much the limit of this craft. So we know it can do its limit if it's gonna land down. You see it's got a lot of speed coming down here. Um, if it can manage this, it's at its limit with there's no point going any further with this craft it is basically as far as it can go and we're going to do a parachute landing again 
um, just because it's actually a little quicker than uh, than if we actually la pull it into land. Um, we pull it down, and that's it. That's potentially the end of that craft. So, before just before we do our um, our big mission, we are going to launch a couple of sounding rockets. We've got still got sounding rocket missions we can do. So this first one is a sounding rocket. Um, just up to uh, let's see the uh, uh, 260 kilometers with 100 units of payload and it gets it easily enough we're using those new engines this is pretty much a, 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 a stripped down core of the red princess uh, three so we're just going to range safety it when it gets near the atmosphere and then we're going to try another one and these were quick to build these, these cores we, we, we build them quite easily now and this one got an extra payload on there um, and this is going for uh, another contract, which is 140 kilometers up, 350 units of payload. And we're going to try and get 580 kilometers downrange. So we're actually testing the Red Princess's core unit now. It's got a heavy load on there. You'll notice we switched off the middle engine. Uh, sorry, we switched off uh, the four outer engines and left the middle engine on just to give us a little bit of fine control. This is something we're trying with our, uh, our Farley engines it's set up. Um, and we're now trying it with the rockets as well. Interestingly, Saturn V did sort of the opposite and shut down its middle engine often when it was launching. Anyway, let's get ready for the big one, I think. We'll just uh, probably finish this one. You don't need to see this come back down. Let's blow it up. All right, so this is the big one. This is the Red Princess 3B. This is the one we're hoping is gonna take us to orbit. So let's get the engines going, get them up to power, and then off we go. So. You can see it has, well, it looks like two side boosters. It's got three side boosters on it. Each of them has, I think, five engines. And they are pushing it up as much as possible. So you've got basically 15 engines or so on the first stage. Um, the main center core is not lit. Um, it's not lit because we're actually trying to delay its, the, the burn times on these. The Gamma 301 engine only has a burn time of you know, around about two minutes so um, that is not enough for me to have powered flight all the way up to orbit I'd have to have a, a coast stage and then that brings in stability issues and things like that so these side boosters are pretty much um, they're well they're the, the red princess sort of uh, the red well the red prince 3 um, smaller sort of stack length with with new engines in. so they use more fuel got more thrust but they, they don't burn as long and then um, in the center there we actually have the core that you've seen on those the, the final sounding payload uh, which is is pretty much the red princess 3b core so we're gonna burn these off and then just before they burn out we're gonna look to light the middle engines on that, that uh, main engines on the middle core so they're now lit so now we're at a max thrust right now and then we just get rid of that and off we go so this is off to the the stars hopefully well <laughs> orbit so um in in a normal sort of launch program if you look at the atlas for example they would have lit all three of their engines on the ground um, and they would have had a long sustainer stage in the middle um we could have done something like that if we'd have used uh what would have been a spectre engine which have longer burn times but i'm avoiding those because number one uh, they didn't really come around at this timeline point for us but uh, secondly, um, I'm focusing on the gamma engines. Now it's important to remember these are not the gamma engines that you would have found on the Black Arrow. These are these are actually gamma 301s. The Black Arrow had very much uprated gamma engines. They had more power, more thrust uh, and everything. These generally were, were quite reliable, although we have had a few um, reliability issues, shall we say, you've seen earlier on in the episode. And hopefully by having those launches, we've actually got through that problem. Now it's important to remember this craft, although it's going for orbit, it doesn't actually have a payload. The fairings at the top are pretty much empty. Um, we're basically doing this as a proof of concept, proof of idea. Um, the Black Arrow, when it went to orbit, it had uh, the uh, the Prospero satellite on board. Um, of course, the R7 that went to orbit had had Sputnik on, and then you've got uh, you got Explorer One and things like that. Um, so this isn't, in my mind, it's not really first orbit if we make it because it's not putting a satellite as such up. We're actually going to orbit, but we're not going to have the first satellite. 
because the battery power on this is not going to be that great and we'll, we'll see that now and in fact you'll see that the battery power is dying on the boosters that we have so those boosters um they just had they probably had a little bit too much battery life i could have actually lightened them down a little bit by reducing that um so hopefully this will complete the contract we are in you know that the 4th of august 1955 so we're, we're we're quite early on. We haven't actually got orbital rocketry yet either, which is, is interesting. So the bonuses we've got from these gamma engines have really allowed us to, uh, by clustering them and having high reliability, to do this uh, this this launch. Now, interesting clustering of, of things like this was, was actually a proposal that the British did make, although it was actually for their the Blue Street craft, uh, if I remember rightly. Um, they actually looked at uh, when there was issues with Eldor um, and in its progress, they looked at whether they could actually make an all British launcher. And one of the proposals was to basically stick two blue streak, uh, sorry, three blue streak missiles next to uh, next to each other and have them push each other up and then put a, a different stage on the top. And there's all sorts of different proposals. And if you're interested, there is some, some really good uh, sort of texts on it that you can probably find. And I might, I might try and link below if I remember, or just ask me and I will find them for you and, and put a link down there. Um, but there was all sorts of sort of crazy wacky little ideas using only British technology to do this. Obviously Blue Streak comes along a little bit after this point in the timeline. It's uh, sort of aligned with the, the birth of the, the S3 engine in America. Um, Pratt & Whitney and Rolls-Royce had a lot of collaboration over jet engines and, and it went both ways. They got rocket engine technology going to Rolls-Royce and vice versa. So we've hot staged our, our top stage there and we've fired it. And you can see it doesn't actually have a payload. It is the payload. Um, it is unguided, so we've spin stabilized it by firing those uh, the solid motors at an, a little angle just as we released it. We hot staged it because we don't have ullage on this and I don't trust the, the, the spin stabilization to provide that ullage straight away. And we're off and you'll see that we've actually, we've positioned our, our vector just below the horizon to start with because we know we're gonna keep burning for, you know, two minutes. So over that time, basically our orientation of our craft is gonna stay as it is now, but relative to the earth, it's gonna change. So we're gonna end up, instead of facing down towards the earth so much, we're actually probably gonna face hopefully along the horizon because ideally, as our burn finishes, we want our, our, our forward vector to be perfectly along the horizon, along the prograde, and we wanna be at our apoapse point just as we finish our burn because then we can, we're circularizing, okay? If we wanted a perfectly circular orbit, we want to have our our apoapse being that point and our fuel running out at the exact same moment that we basically circularize. This craft is not that accurate. So what I'm expecting is that we're actually going to end up with, if we get to orbit, and it's still debatable at this point. So we'll just speed up a bit because this burn takes a while. Um, we're going to end up with a, a very, I would imagine, elliptical orbit. We're either, you know, if we get to orbit just, that would probably be better than if we get an elliptical one because our batteries will hopefully last for a full orbit then. But if you see now, we're actually now facing slightly upwards. So if you look on the ball, although we're spinning, we're just above the horizon. So we're actually pushing our, our apoapse away from us. So we're actually going to be, there we go. We're just into orbit, well, hey. So there we are, we're in orbit. And now all we're doing is burning off excess fuel. We could stop the engines right now and be happy with it, but we just we might as well burn it off. So we're going into a, a nice high arcing elliptical orbit that, that may get us some old sort of uh, marker contracts, you know, for the highest this and the highest that and whatnot. Also by burning it, we potentially could have got a speed record, which would be nice. Um, but we'll get quite a lot of random little records for this craft. Now we've got to check our science situation because we've got a science core on there. We may not have a uh, avionics guidance core, but we do have a science core on so we can just check what science is available. This isn't a science craft though. Um, it's not a science satellite, so we're not gonna get a lot. We're gonna get, you know, basically situational data. Um, Sputnik and things like that, they, well, Sputnik was very much a sort of a proof of concept as well. It was send a signal around the earth, prove that we've got first satellite. Explorer had the uh, the equipment to detect the, or start to detect the Van Allen belt and things like that. And that was, that was obviously an interesting craft. It was built in a very short time to fulfill a, a requirement. Um, so there we are, we are in orbit. Now, I'm not entirely sure if we're gonna class this as first satellite because we don't class the nose cone of the Saturn V as the first satellite, uh, sorry, Saturn V, the, the nose cone of the uh, the R7 with Sputnik as the first satellite. Um, but you know what, we've, we've hit our contract. We have put something into orbit. Um, 
I'm guessing our next contract will probably be satellites, in which case we may need to operate this launcher, which means we may need to go back to the drawing board a little bit. And um, we're probably in the next episode gonna look at some different engines. We've used gamma engines all the way through right now, but we've got things like Spectre engines coming online. Those are longer burning than the gamma engines, use the same fuel. And if we get to orbital rocketry, we're gonna get the uh, the R RZ-1 and RZ-2 engines, which are pretty much the S3 and LR, LR79 type engines developed by Pratt and & Whitney and, and so forth. So we're gonna leave it there in orbit, but we're not gonna tell anybody about it just yet. So until next time, have a great one and from orbit, see you.